Hello and welcome to Food Tanks webinar series. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Sarah Small. I'm Food Tanks Global Events Director. I'm really excited about today's webinar with Gianna Bonus Profumo. She's the Young Earth Solutions, or YES, Ambassador at the Barilla Center for Food and Nutrition, or BCFN. Uh, today, her presentation will focus on how food-based approaches and nutrition-sensitive agriculture programs can address malnutrition in developing countries. This webinar will be recorded and posted on foodtank.com afterwards. You can also follow along and participate on Twitter using hashtag foodtank. Also, please submit your questions using the questions tab in your control panel or email them to Sarah, S-A-R-A-H, at foodtank.com. So without further ado, Gianna, it's wonderful to have you here today, and I'm excited to hear your presentation. I'll give you the floor now. Good morning. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really excited to be today with the Food Tank um, and um, to be hosting this webinar. I'd like to give a special thank you to Danielle Nierenberg for inviting me to be here today, and of course to Sarah Small for organizing it. Um, it's an honor really to be part of this webinar series uh, that are informing and inspiring people about to, um, how to fix our broken food system. So today I'll present some information on how nutrition sensitive agricultural programs and food based approaches can address malnutrition in developing countries. And I'll specifically showcase uh, the Food and Nutrition Hub project which combines both approaches into a practical initiative that is about to commence in East Timor. And so, as defining a problem well is key to identify adequate solutions, the webinar will start with a review on malnutrition, providing some definitions, stats, um, and its causes. But first of all, um, let me introduce myself briefly. So, my name is Gianna Moniz Profumo, and yeah, I'm the founder and project manager of the Food and Nutrition Hub a project that aims to empower women to prevent malnutrition in a sustainable manner. The project idea, as Sarah said, won the Young Earth Solutions Contest in 2014, organized by the Barilla Center for Food and Nutrition. Um, and it, uh, but basically, I'm a, I'm a development practitioner and who is really passionate about food and nutrition security issues. And it's an area that I've had the opportunity to work with indigenous women and children and from which I've learned about the complexities of ensuring good nutrition in disadvantaged communities. And so in a few days, I'm moving to Timor-Leste to commence the project implementation. Um, so you can imagine how excited I am to bring to reality this project. But first, let's have a look at malnutrition, um, which is understood as lack of proper nutrition caused by not having enough to eat, not eating enough of the right things, or even being unable to use the food that one does eat due to being sick. So there's two types generally. There's undernourishment, uh, which exists when caloric intake is below the minimum um, dietary intake, um, which means energy levels. And so, that's around 2,300 calories. And nowadays we have 795 million people who don't, are not able to access um, and to consume this amount of calories. So this means one in nine people are not able to get enough food to be healthy and to lead an active lifestyle. So undernutrition can trap children, families, communities, and even nations in an intergenerational cycle of poor nutrition, illness, and poverty. And so that's generally what's equated uh, with hunger. That's the way it's quantified, the number of people who is not able to consume enough energy for their caloric needs. So on the other hand, we also have malnourishment, which is, um, you have, which is eating and consuming calorie-rich um, diets, but uh, with, of poor quality. And so this leads to two different scenarios. One is uh, macronutrient deficiencies, um, which are essential for growth, such as iron, vitamin A, iodine, and zinc. Um, and they result in what's called hidden hunger, in, in the sense that it's not visible. Um, and it affects 2 billion people. Later on, well, I'll, I'll, I'll expand on this. And then also we have um, excessive caloric consumption, um, which is translated in obesity, which is also due to poor quality diets. And that affects half a billion adults um, nowadays in the world. And so we'll have a quick look at um, the proportion and number of undernourished or hungry people 
uh, which has decreased from 1 billion in the 1990s to 795 million now, uh, just in 2015, which affects uh, around 15% of the population in developing countries, which I think is still extremely high, particularly when we have, apologies, so many uh, resources and abundance. And so this is a distribution of um, the uh, hunger um, nowadays. And as uh, we can see, uh, it's mainly focused in Asia and Africa. However, Asia is the continent where the most hungry people are in terms of absolute numbers. And on the other hand, in Sub-Saharan Africa is the region with the highest prevalence, so the percentage of population uh, who is hungry. So one in four people are undernourished um, in Africa. And so this is a, um, a map of the hidden hunger um, from 2013. And again, it translates in, uh, in both the same areas. But let's have a look. Who are, who are the malnourished? So the malnourished tend to live in, um, um, in, in poor and rural communities in developing countries. Um, most of them, 50%, are smallholder farmers um, who produce food but also buy some, lenders, workers, fisher folk, pastoralists, uh, forest dwelling peoples, and also the urban poor. However, women uh, make the majority of the world's uh, small-scale subsistence farmers, and they also produce most of the food in, in many developing countries. So it's important to highlight that, um, that there is a gender bias in terms of who are the malnourished, um, as women and, and girls account for over 60% of the world's undernourished. And so targeting women farmers in rural areas of developing countries by doing that, we can have the most impact in reducing world malnutrition. As you will see, this is a passion of mine. Um, another very important one is, is children, children malnutrition, because children are the future of a country. And if many of them are malnourished, it can compromise its ability to develop. So particularly if there's a high incidence of stunting or low height for age, that means when babies are too short for their age. Um, this, this reflects on uh, chronic malnutrition and, and also frequent infections. Um, so how can this compromise a nation's future? Well, stunting uh, affects the physical and cognitive development capacity in children, as well as making them more prone to disease. And that impacts into the school performance and also in, in their productivity when they're adults. So poor nutrition in the first thousand days of children's life can have irreversible consequences. And that's what happened with stentings. And this, it can trap those children in a vicious circle of poverty and undernutrition. And so that's why it's key to develop interventions that can be delivered during those thousand, 1,000 days, the critical 1,000 days window of opportunity, which is from uh, the time of conception until uh, the age of two. Uh, which can reduce to the, which can lead to the reduction of prevalence of stunting. And so, luckily, and the good news is that, uh, of course, stunting has decreased um, from 40% in the 1990s to 26% um, of, uh, in 2011 in, um, in developing countries. However, these countries such as Timor-Leste, where still one in two kids are chronically malnourished. And of course, you know, even though they've improved, um, they're still one of the highest prevalence in the world. So this is something we need, we need to look at. Let's have a look briefly at the determinants of nutrition and, and, the under, and their underlying causes. So nutritional status is influenced by three broad factors, food, health, and care. In a more refined conceptualization, the immediate causes of nutrition are nutritious intake and health. And, and that gets complemented with the underlying causes, which are access to food, maternal and child, um, uh, child care practices, and water and sanitation um, uh, availability. 
And so the optimal status of, of uh, nutrition results when children have access to affordable, diverse, nutrient-rich food. Nutrient-rich, this is very important. Also appropriate maternal and childhood practices, adequate health services, and a healthy environment, including safe water, sanitation, and good hygiene practices. So there's two kinds of nutrition interventions that aim to address the causes of malnutrition. There's nutrition-specific interventions that address the immediate causes of um, nutrition, and they're particularly directed at those 1,000 days that I was explaining before. And there's also nutrition-sensitive um, interventions which aim to address the underlying determinants of nutrition through other sectors and those can be agriculture, food security, education, social protection, sanitation, which incorporate specific nutrition goals. So in this case we're going to look at nutrition sensitive agriculture. And so why? Well, why nutrition sensitive agriculture? So agriculture and rural development provide a crucial opportunity for reducing malnutrition not only because large proportions of malnourished populations live in rural areas, but also because agriculture is their main source of livelihood. So improving nutrition outcomes of smallholder farmers will improve their productivity due to better health while potentially reducing child malnutrition in a sustainable way. So the objective is to develop targeted agriculture and livestock programs focused on first, improving access to high quality and diverse diets. And second, enhancing poor households' income that can uh, complement efforts to increase agricultural productivity. And so examples of those could include staples fortifications, homestead food production, and animals, animal source food interventions. Um, and so the pathways by which agricultural programs can improve nutritional outcomes have been widely discussed and they're shown in the slide. But what it's clearly agreed among scholars is that women, women are the key mediators in the pathways between agricultural inputs, how food is distributed within the household, and child nutrition. And so it also recognizes that women's control over resources and income flows have a disproportionate positive impact on household health and nutrition. This is so exciting, I find. Because this uh, framework gives emphasis to measuring the nutritional impact of agricultural projects, which may seem obvious, but it doesn't really happen on a widespread basis. Normally, agriculture and nutrition, they operate generally in separate areas, funding-wise and implementation-wise. And so, due to this reason, agricultural progr uh, programs have had little impact on child malnutrition and, an incorporating a, and so incorporating a nutrition lens um, to them is crucial if stunting levels are to be reduced. So nutrition-sensitive agricultural development can support households' livelihoods by enhancing their capabilities and productive asset base, while at the same time ensuring the necessary nutrition requirements for rural populations to fully participate in educational and labor activities, and they're vital for economic growth. Moreover, poor dietary quality can be addressed too by developing agricultural programs that diversify food crops, thus making them nutrition sensitive. So let's have a look at how. So a non-diverse diet is almost synonym of micronutrient deficiencies. For example, eating mostly uh, rice. So micronutrient deficiencies can lead to poor growth. And also inadequate intake of specific micronutrients such as iron, folic acid, and iodine have demonstrated harmful impact on the development of the brain and nervous system and on subsequent school performance. So there are two main approaches to address micronutrient deficiencies or hidden hunger. There's a clinical approach, which focuses on single nutrient supplementations through public health campaigns, and food-based approaches that aim to address deficiencies through, um, through food, either by a biofortification, food supplementation, or household food production. So based on the rationale that most micronutrient deficiencies can actually be solved with relatively small increases in the variety of food consumed, because greater dietary diversity is associated with improved growth and nutrient status. 
So food-based approaches understand nutrition as part of a system and not only as a reductionist um, approach where, where nutrients is, uh, are considered in isolation. But they're not mutually exclusive, these approaches. In many instances, both are needed at unison. We need to work um, together. Um, so which are the benefits of particularly looking at household food production? Um, it is one of the uh, food-based approaches. It, it really, I'm really passionate about that one because it really focuses on strengthening local food security, which means it's a more resilient approach. It does not depend on large external funding to fund those public health campaigns. Uh, it it um, less people less vulnerable to external shocks such as price volatility and ensures a stable food security through yearly round crops. Um, it also supports biodiversity and agrodiverse food systems, um, which helps to halt the environmental degradation, um, which is key to ensure the um, resources for future generations. It is also a cost-effective um, approach in the sense that it, particularly when it's combined with nutrition education um, and in context with minimal health systems uh, presence. It also um, supports income generation opportunities as if um, through these agricultural um, interventions uh, there's more food produced, surplus can be sold to the market. And it also has indirect long-term um, outcomes, such as women's empowerment, strengthening local capacity, and um, own, uh, community ownership, and environmental sustainability. And so I'm making a strong case for the food-based approaches to those malnutrition deficiencies, because despite its documented successes, they have failed to gain scientific acceptance and adequate funding. And this is partly because they've been inadequately evaluated and because their outcomes go beyond biological levels of micronutrients, um, and they can only be measured in the long term, such as women's empowerment or you know, environmental sustainability. And so, on the other hand, we need to be mindful that there, you know, this approach, food-based approach, requires a minimal level of health and water sanitation to be effective, and it can address uh, acute causes. But it can still address hidden hunger effectively with multiple social and environmental outcomes. And so I'll introduce you now to the Food and Nutrition Hub project, which um, evolved from being from this big problem of malnutrition to a specific solution. And so the scope initially was uh, Southeast Asia, and now uh, I'm focusing particularly in Timor-Leste. And so this project emerged from a university paper, and now it's being transformed into a real world project. So let's have a look at the Prezi from uh, the Food and Nutrition Hub because, um, yeah, it was simply too cute not to not to include it um, in today's webinar. So please bear with me. I'm just going to do the swap of screen and. Yep. Yeah. OK. Let's go. Okay. So welcome to Prezi. So Diana, the food and nutrition your, hub. Your screen isn't showing yet. Can you try one more? It's time? not? Not yet, no. Oh, apologies. Okay. And I hope it does, because like she said, it's very cute. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Can you see it now? Yes, that's great. Okay. Apologies for that, everyone. Okay. Okay. So, welcome to the Food and Nutrition Hub Prezi presentation. <laughs> Um, so the Food Nutrition Hub goal is to empower women to prevent malnutrition in a sustainable manner. It aims to improve the dietary intake of women and children by enhancing the sustainable production of nutritious foods at the household level and by teaching adequate feeding practices. The Hub is a community resource center where agricultural inputs are provided and generated, and it is a place where sustainable agriculture techniques are taught and demonstrated in combination with nutrition education activities. 
And so what's this project trying to, um, to address? Well, first we're going to go to Timor-Leste. Let me please introduce you to this very young and very small nation, which is um, in the north of Australia, in the south bit of Southeast Asia. And it emerged as an independent country in 2002, after four centuries of Portuguese colonial rule and 24 years of Indonesian occupation. So this is institutional fragility, which is key to understand its current situation as one of the poorest countries in Southeast Asia, where 41% of its population is living below the poverty line, and it only has a 1.2 million um, people. So rural populations in Timor-Leste experience the highest levels of poverty, food insecurity, and malnutrition. They are over 70% of the population and are characterized by difficulties for accessing services and markets due to poor infrastructure and remoteness. And so the malnutrition cycle is common amidst uh, rural populations and it means that malnourished mothers give birth to low weight babies, which are more likely to grow into undernourished adults that will reproduce the cycle once again. So this project focuses particularly on addressing stunting due to the irreversible consequences that it has in children, as we have seen. So the majority of the rural population base their livelihoods in subsistence agriculture, mainly focusing on rice and maize production. Some have vegetable gardens with small uh, livestock systems, including poultry, which women tend to care for. However, those are low input and low output systems where animals are raised under poor conditions and productivity is low. Yet I'll argue how women are the key to break the malnutrition cycle and ensure their children's future. Let's see how. This is our solution. The Food Nutrition Hub works to support rural women in two ways, the two pillars of the project. First, through teaching and demonstrating integrated vegetable and poultry production. And second, through nutrition education activities. So it's a simple yet effective solution to a very complex, to a very complex problem. And so this project proposes a food-based approach to address malnutrition through household food production, and it is based on two conceptual frameworks, nutrition-sensitive agriculture, by focusing on the pathways in which women can bridge agriculture and nutrition outcomes, and a sustainable livelihood framework by strengthening all assets in which livelihood strategies rely on. So let's have a look at the first pillar. The first pillar focuses on integrating poultry systems in vegetable gardens. Chicken enclosures are used to rotate across different garden beds to fertilize and manage pests. Once a crop is harvested, chickens are moved from one, uh, from one garden uh, bed to the next to work on it. And so there's various models of chicken enclosures, some that are mobile, such as the ones above, and the ones that are permanent, such as the ones below, um, which are fenced. And so this is a sustainable agriculture technique because it improves soil fertility through chicken manure, which replenishes the nitrogen cycle, which is a mineral that's crucial for plant growth and it enhances soil biology. It also turns food waste into a valuable acid, poultry feed, and uh, chickens clear weeds and control pests, thus saving time and labor in garden preparation. It also through continuous practice with this method, it improves the natural resource base and it results in productivity gains. Also the hub, Supplementary feed is grown to boost the productivity through insect farms. So by breeding worms and black soil flies larvae, which are rich in protein and fats and fed with uh, household food waste, um, we ensure the nutritional content of eggs. And so this approach enables to produce more and diverse nutrient-dense food sustainably. And so this is the key to focus not only on what is produced, but also on ensuring that it has a high nutritional content. And so the second pillar focuses on nutrition education, because we have seen how women are the key mediators of health within the family unit. So it uses social behavior change communication, which is delivered in a culturally meaningful way, by considering women's social context and by using appropriate training methodologies. This approach improves feeding practices of women and children for a balanced diet, and it, it will particularly focus on complementary feeding practices, which is um, when child, children start eating solids after weaning from breastfeeding. 
So these are protein rates, um, multiple um, nutrition outcomes because it decreases the dietary intake of protein and micronutrients, which are essential and fundamental for child growth. And this is done through vegetables, eggs, and meat consumption. And so this enhances diet diversification. But let's focus on eggs because eggs are exceptional. They are a source of high quality protein, vitamin A and B12, iron and zinc. They come in a hygienic and safe package on a regular basis. They are good for feeding children and they are culturally acceptable. And by the way, this Friday is, happens to be International Egg Day. So I encourage you to tweet about the amazing potential of eggs supporting nutrition with the hashtag World Egg Day 2015. <laughs> Um, so when both pillars are combined, a third outcome emerges, which is women's empowerment. So this, these two pillars then increase women's decision-making power in two ways, by creating small income opportunities through the sale of surplus produce and thus enhancing their status, and also by building their skills through knowledge and education. So women are able to provide for their family well-being, generalizing a sense of dignity. And so women are the agents of change um, the, by creating a more resilient and diverse household food production system. And so that is why improving chicken um, husbandry practices is crucial because it enables women to participate in a holistic approach to address malnutrition by combining the right knowledge with the means to achieve it. So what's the implementation plan? So now I'm about to start implementing the project. And now I mean literally in less than two weeks. So I'm already talking with international NGOs, different uh, local NGOs and some government departments to refine the project to the local context and to tailor it to the specific needs of the communities that we will work with. So the idea is to run a pilot project uh, in different districts in order to measure its impact and generate evidence of its effectiveness. And this is, again, to further support food-based approaches and, and provide, yes, yeah, some more, um, hopefully, documentation for this approach. And so with that regard, I'm also considering to partner with a research institution or even a research project. So I'm still considering this. Simultaneously, I'm still seeking for funding opportunities. I have uh, money for to start up. Um, we need more funds to be able to, to implement it fully. So the project is a model, really, that could be replicated in different countries. It requires a small startup budget and it, making it a low-cost intervention. And it can also be operated as a social enterprise in the midterm. And so the Food and Nutrition Hub project um, has different outcomes, and they're multiple. It improves child and maternal nutrition through food-based approach. It promotes sustainable uh, farming practices, which are paramount in this era of climate instability. It also enhances the decision-making power of women um, and their empowerment. It provides the food and nutrition security of the rural poor in, in Timor-Leste. And it is a high impact and cost-effective solution that works on creating resilience at the local level. So the Food and Nutrition Hub project will transform the lives of mothers and children in rural Timor-Leste by empowering women to prevent malnutrition sustainably. Because the well-being of rural populations depends upon the achievement of ecologically sustainable livelihoods for local food security. And so a final trick. You know the famous, the famous sentence, give a man a fish, feed him for a day, teach a man a fish, feed him for a lifetime? Well, Joel Negging got a better one. Give a woman a fish, feed her for a day, teach a woman to fish, and support her with low, level, uh, low levels of financing needing to buy a fishing rod, some worms, and an ice rock, and feed her household for a lifetime. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gianna. That was a great and informative presentation.
Uh, we do have a lot of questions from our listeners, but a reminder to continue to send any questions you have using your chat box or email them to me at sarah at foodtank.com. So for the next 15 minutes or so, we'll go through as many as possible. Gianna, I'd like to start by asking you a question from a listener named Mike. He says, hi, Gianna, great presentation. Have you found in your work a negative effect from past Western agricultural aid that is heavy in corn, soy, sugar, and light in micronutrients and diversity? That's a great question. Um, not in my experience, in my personal experience, in my direct experience. Um, for example, in, in Timor Leste, uh, there is no, um, it's a net uh, food importer. Uh, so they basically import right to provide for their needs. There's no soy, um, there's no soy being grown there. Um, so it's probably a bit different than in that in other countries, but definitely I'm really aware that um, with the monocultures of these of these particular crops, a lot of um, local populations get displaced, and and traditional um, common lands get used um, in you know for the benefit of 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 these bigger projects. So. Not in my experience, which I'm really thankful, um, and I'm really looking forward to go to to Timor and see how how we can support them for this not to happen to them. So thanks for your question. Great, thank you. And uh, the next question reads: uh, What originally inspired you to create the Food and Nutrition Hub project? What actually inspired me was really the realization that. Um, well, the irony that the most the hungry people in the world are subsistence farmers who grow food for a living. That really that really tweaked with my head, and and that really surprised me. And when I was doing more research through my masters at the university, and and by doing this briefing paper on nutrition sensitive agricultural development, then realizing the the role of women amongst amongst this um, in a being food producers uh, themselves. And also by being more vulnerable to food insecurity and malnutrition, um, combined with my personal um, experience and 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 enjoyment in in working with with women, it really it really it was like the penny drop. I'm like, okay, and you know, I'm a, I'm passionate about the impact, and so I was like, okay, if you know, one of the best ways that it looks to have you know the best impact to address malnutrition and hunger issues is to work with this collective with you know subsistence farmers in rural areas um, and particularly with women who also manage nutrition at, at the household level so for me that was a combination of many of my passions and backgrounds into a very clear um, conceptual framework that I think it's going to guide me for a long time <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, and the next question reads, how are entrepreneurs and or innovators helping address nutrition sensitive agriculture and is there room for growth in this area as well? Yes, of course there's room for growth in this area. I mean, I guess I consider myself, yeah, a social entrepreneur and, and I mean, how there's so many rural areas in this world with um, people who need, you know, a bit of support in, in being able to provide for their own needs a little bit better um, and so the whole idea about di diversifying crops it's about many times supporting you know going back to more traditional practices or integrating you know animals with um, with vegetable production and that needs to be of course uh, contextual to the to the local context and the and the traditional crops and having a look perhaps of what are the most nutritious uh, species um, but I think there's a lot of scope for, um, you know, group associate, you know, like producers associations or cooperative to grow to provide for their own needs, but then to be able to sell uh, surplus in an aggregated manner. So I think that, um, you know, and that also combining with value adding um, into the produce and and perhaps selling to to also to urban centers, because at the end of the day. This could be a really win-win situation where there's an increase in the demand for nutrition, nutrient-dense uh, food in urban areas, um, and 
rural producers may have the opportunity to be able to tap into that if there's enough infrastructure and and market channels. So that's an area that I think nutrition sensitive agricultural development could tap in because it would make provide yeah, nutritious food um, at the household level for vulnerable populations while at the same time may perhaps being able to provide um, for a more urban context. Thanks, Jana. And we have some questions regarding animal, animal agriculture and diversifying. So the first one reads, I have a problem with the focus on animal agriculture, particularly the egg industry, which has been exposed for its unsustainable um, water consumption and, of course, treatment of animals. So he's wondering what you have to, to say about that. And then the other question is, can you describe the importance of diversity within farming systems when implementing approaches like yours? Okay, so I mean, I agree that there's a lot of uh, I mean, animal um, uh, animal rearing that um, that pose a lot of questions in terms of ethics and environmental impact. Um, but I think we need to distinguish um, between you know village or community based approaches and more industrial scale ones or commercial scale ones so the one that uh, we're proposing through the food and nutrition hub it's all at the household or community or village level which is non-commercial which is um, about you know supporting a very low impact um, animal husbandry uh, practices um, so that's quite different to to what we would have in 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 the developed countries or when they on the, they provide it on a, on a commercial scale. So I think that the criteria and, and and requirements from projects would be would be very different. And I personally, I mean, I personally don't eat meat for um, uh, ethical reasons. Um, and so I, I personally don't find any ethical issues with supporting animals in a house at a household. Uh, level um, as such in this context with uh, yeah, such a low impact. I think it's actually something that should be encouraged and funded more broadly because the nutritional gains and human gains that we can have from it are very, very, very clear. Um, and sorry, what was the second question? How to diversify? Could you please repeat, Sarah? The second part of the question or, or second listener's question was, uh, can you describe the importance of diversity within farming systems when implementing food-based food -based approaches to malnutrition? Yeah. So diversity of, um, of um, cropping systems is uh, super important in the sense of uh, enhancing biodiversity and, um, and ensuring the... Um, the uh, the health the, you know the health of the soil and also the human health so it's it's all about this some um, symbiotic relationship between yeah human health the environment and um and and uh, and biodiversity so i guess the idea is to try to incorporate as many elements as possible uh, into the system and to be able to on the one hand provide for um, diet um, diversity, so trying to incorporate different um, crops that uh, have different sources of micronutrients in them to be able to to revert into into the health of the family, while at the same time trying to care for the environment. So, in generally, I have a bit of a permaculture background, and you know the use of animals for um, nutrient uh, cycling and nutrient management. It's it's really really important. And, and that's something that's been practiced for, you know, for, for, for millennia um, when, when that's adequate for the environmental um, climate and, and environment where you are. So I think it's about trying to look those synergies in, in terms of how you're able to better provide for human needs and for the animals' needs, but also for the environmental needs. And, um, and trying to assess what are the you know, traditionally grown crops, indigenous crops of that area, which generally tend to be better you know, acclimatized to, to pest disease and even climatic variation. Um, and, that, and many times are also more nutritious than, than other, than other you know, hybrid sort of developed um, breeds. So yeah, I would do a lot of research of what's being grown and trying to diversify the system for resilience too, because then you know more diverse system is a lot more resistant to yeah, pests and and it ensures a higher degree level of uh, of food security 
um, because it'd be it's quite unlikely then that all of the crops will fail at once, you know, compared to a monoculture. It's a lot more risky in that regard. Thanks. Thank you, Gianna. Uh, and I think you actually started to answer a little bit of this next question talking about um, culturally appropriate and regional crops. But uh, Mariana wants to know, or she first she writes, thank you, Gianna. It was an inspiring presentation. And her question is, besides the egg focus, do you consider a specific set of vegetables more recommended to grow? Well, there's... Um there's some like dark leafy greens that are particularly um, high in iron and there's like um, for example like the orange flesh sweet potato that it's really high on vitamin a so they are like um, they're two very good um, crops for i mean and that again the crops depend to the climatic to the climate you know the bioregion and and your climatic area um, but if those are available, uh, they you know they're very good for these two particular sources. Um, then there's uh, also the moringa, which is a tropical tree, which is also packed with micronutrients and um, and minerals, um, which is also also very recommended to use in complementary feeding, uh, like sprinkles or like topping of porridges, in order to ensure child child malnutrition. Um, there's a great project in, in Indonesia doing this, the IDEP Foundation. Um, so I guess that's quite regionally uh, specific. But I guess from yeah from the plant world, I would choose those ones. And definitely from the animal world, um, I'm a fan of chickens because they're easy to manage and you can get a regular supply of protein without having to um, to process the animal. Thank you. Uh, and the next question, uh, actually two that I'll, that I'll pair together, but the first part is, uh, I'm curious why Southeast Asia was your, is your pilot area for their implementing the program. Uh, if there's anything that makes it unique, or, and if it's successful, will the hub uh, model be scalable? And then Anna wants to know, uh, do you currently have an idea of what data you'll be monitoring or measuring to evaluate the impact of this pilot program in Southeast Asia? Yeah, great question. Thank you so much. Um, my reason for choosing Southeast Asia, um, I guess that was came out of combination of personal preference because I just feel really interested and attracted by the culture and I've traveled extensively in this area and that's where I like to focus uh, my work. But also uh, it was circumstantial in, in that at the university when I was doing this briefing paper, it was... Um, uh, it was to support a, a, a large research application uh, which was focusing on four countries of Southeast Asia. And so I undertook a country profile of Indonesia, uh, Laos, PDR, Myanmar, and Timor Leste. And so I extensively looked at these particularly four countries, at their frameworks and um, you know agricultural systems and 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 food and uh, food and nutrition security status. So. That was sort of a perfect match, and also by living, um, I live in Australia, and that's one of the key areas where there's a lot more, you know, research and funding for, for projects. So that was, um, I guess, my main reason. And out of them, there was no choice, or so I ended up, you know, choosing Timor Leste as a place as a place to start implementing it is because I've been, yeah, I've been in this, I was in this country uh, five years ago. Um, I used to live in Darwin, which is a very similar climatic region, so I feel familiar with, with the tropics. Um, and also it's a very high need area, um, which is a lot, you know, the stunting prevalence there is a lot higher than in the other cases. Um, and also being such a close neighbor to Australia, which has been my home country for the last almost decade, um, I feel, yeah, I feel it's, it's, a, it's a good place where to start. Um, so in terms of, um, of measuring the impact of the project, um, yes, there is, there are some resources out there and, and different approaches, uh, in terms of how to go about it. I mean, ideally they talk about, you know, like in academia, it's all about randomized trials and, and trying to control variables, but from a social science perspective, uh, this is sometimes very difficult to to implement. And at the day of the, at the end of the day, 
I think we, it's important to try to uh, find models where we can also um, measure the synergistic um, outcomes and, and more indirect outcomes that, that emerge from these sort of projects. Um, such as you know women's empowerment like how do we measure women's empowerment and how can we do that in a short time frame so there are different um there are different um models proposed uh and usda is 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 doing a great work on that but um i'm really interested in in trying to delve a little bit more into these more um you know indirect outcomes and and how to measure the impact of these projects um, in a more creative way and also by involving the participation of of the populations and, and really trying to to report on the perception of um, of you know of the participants of the project and not just um, our measurements so a combination of both um, and also back to the scalability scalability of the intervention of course I mean, I, from, from my perspective, I think it's definitely a scalable uh, proposal, and and that's the whole my whole strategy is to is to yeah to run the pilot project in different districts to try to run a good evaluation um, with it, which will combine both quantitative and qualitative um, data. As I said, I think that taking the perceptions and and, and grasping the richness of um, of you know the story of change and and of of growth of um, in these projects is really important and and that needs to be reported in a, in a bit of a different way than than with numbers but I love both um, and then so yeah once we have this uh, this evaluation report which hopefully shows uh, a positive impact and and interesting outcomes then um, the idea would be to try to scale it up. And, and implement it at a broader at a broader scale in Timor Leste. And I mean, and if other organizations or anyone else is interested in this approach, by no means, you know, let's join forces and, and trial it in, in different places and, and 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 expand it. Because at the end of the day, um, you know, the whole objective of this really is to try to you know support those rural populations who who are more vulnerable to to all this. Um, um, you know fluctuations in in climate and and health in in their own households. So, yeah, please contact me if you'd like to um, consider that. That's wonderful. Thank you, Gianna. Uh, and then the next uh, or last two questions we have are kind of looking forward towards the future as well. So, the first is uh, where do you anticipate um, funding to come from for the project for it to be financially sustainable? And the second part uh, is, where is your work headed and how will it impact communities in the future, especially in regard to climate change? Excellent. Excellent questions. Yeah, funding one is always the, the tough one. I mean, I was super lucky that um, through winning the 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 yeah the BCF and yes um, contest, they gave me 10,000 euros, which is around... 15,000 Australian dollars. I can't, I can't remember how many US dollars. Um, but yeah, that's, that's been my startup money, which is um, fantastic, but obviously not enough to run a project. And so my strategy will be to um, run a crowdfunding campaign, but that's once I've started um, you know, working on the ground and identifying partners. Um, and I'm also happy to, I guess, well, not happy, but... I think I'll be able to self-support myself by um, doing other parallel sort of work or maybe trying. Um, I have different strategies in mind that I need to see depending how the donors respond on the ground. But my choice was to not uh, wait till I had all the money for the project um, in the sense that I would have had to wait probably you know, at least a year to have enough funds. Yeah, I'm being a bit bold, I guess, in that regard, and I'm moving over there, and you know, have this these funds to you know, which will enable me to be there at least for six months because it's a you know relatively um, cheap country, um, and also I have my savings, and I have different ways uh, and people that I like to talk to um, about this and different strategies that you know I cannot get in in detail now but yeah that's going to be really interesting but I'm really hoping that it's going to be I guess a diverse <laughs> 
diversified approach a little bit from the fun, a little bit from the price a little bit from the crowdfunding a little bit from hopefully some donors that are going to be interested and yeah um and you know and i'm you know australia is really close and and it pays good wages so i may be able to also pick up some you know consultancy work on evaluations over there or, or in northern australia um and so the future could you please repeat the um the question sarah apologies everyone it's a bit late in australia at the moment <laughs> No problem. Uh, so the the second part was, where is your work headed, and how will it impact communities in the future, especially in regard to climate change? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, personally, I've always dreamt of working in um, you know professional um, non faith based organizations, and that's what I sort of wanted to do. But after you know studying year last year at university, I actually really enjoyed. Uh, going back to to academia, and I was considering maybe to to you know to intertwine uh, project work with uh, you know the third you know the third sector with perhaps uh, a bit of research and teaching at the university. So this is something I'm thinking about now, because um, perhaps that also could be a really good way to contribute. Um, to these great approaches or approaches that I think they could be really effective with some more, um, you know, hard evidence <laughs> that could help perhaps, um, you know, donors to go more the ways, you know, these ways and not, um, you know, more clinical ways, I guess. Um, so, yeah, that's something that I'd like to consider. And, and in terms of climate change, I mean, wow that's that's big and and when i always i don't know for some reason when i think about climate change i always think of bangladesh there's so many million people there and most of them live in the delta and the minute we get a little bit of a sea rise level we're gonna have a lot of people um in a very desperate situation and so i think for me it's a really present you know uh, issue and i think it's gonna affect very differently in different places so I think the work and, and the support the communities will need will differ a lot. Um, there's a lot of Pacific nations too that are, you know, struggling in the sense of, you know, access to water and, and even, you know, land in terms of, again, when the, when the sea rises. Um, and so, yeah, climate change refugees, you know, are already, are already on the go. Um, so yeah, I think this will definitely affect and more and more, uh, particularly in this, you know, in the Asia, in the Asia Pacific region, that's going to be a more pressing issue and the, probably the solutions that we'll need to think about, yeah, they're, again, they'll have to be targeted to the local conditions but, and, and circumstances. But, um, I think that also from a geopolitical level, we will have to, from, you know, from nation's point of view, we'll have to deal with it in a more in a more humane way, really, than what's happening at the moment, um, I guess, particularly in this side of the world. Um, but yeah, I guess working right now with enhancing um, crop resilience and trying to bring back indigenous crops and, you know, trying to uh, restore us, you know, or contain land degradation and erosion uh, should be the strategies that we should be looking at at the moment. But I mean, there's bigger there's bigger picture effects like such as you know uh, the sea the sea level rising that are really a bit out of um, I think of our scope to be able to to address and we'll have to be working more on how to how to support communities to go through these new challenges that are coming in the next few decades I guess. Thank you, Gianna, uh, and thank you to everyone participating. Unfortunately, we're out of time for today, but a huge thank you to you, Gianna, who uh, I think it's nearing 4 a.m. in Australia, so <laughs> probably coming up. Uh, it was truly a pleasure to have you with us here today, and your uh, presentation was really informative and inspiring. Uh, for all of our listeners, we'll have another webinar coming up on October 28th. You can register now on foodtank.com, uh, and this webinar was also re recorded, and if you want to catch it again later, it'll be posted later today on foodtank.com and Food Tank's YouTube channel. So thank you again to everyone and have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Good night.